This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. From coverage of the war by Palestinian journalists on the ground, we turn to coverage by the Israeli media. What do most Israelis see on TV? How is the Israeli media's coverage shaped opinions of war? This is a clip from I-24 News of Israeli military commander Lieutenant Colonel Dotan talking about an alleged Hamas tunnel in an exclusive video shown by the network last week. Now, the IDF has found tunnels and weapons inside a child's room inside the Gaza Strip. These visuals were obtained from the IDF, and I-24 News is now going to be allowed to play that. Let's take a look. During our patrols in the area, we uncovered the entrance to a tunnel under this children's bedroom, actually under this desk, exactly where the children were supposed to study. We can see very clearly the tunnel which goes towards the tunnel gallery. We can also see here these RPG missiles, these munitions grouped in the same sector, including military tactical vests and grenades ready for use. That was a clip from Israeli media outlet I-24 News. For more on Israeli media's coverage of the war, we go to Tel Aviv, where we're joined by Gideon Levy, an award-winning Israeli journalist and author, columnist for the newspaper Aretz, a member of its editorial board. His most recent piece headlined, If It Isn't a Genocide in Gaza, Then What Is It? Gideon, welcome back to Democracy Now! Um, <clears throat> talk about what you, Israelis Amy. see on television, where most get their news, we just did this whole piece on uh, the killing of Gazan journalists, Palestinian journalists. We've never seen anything like this anywhere um, in modern history, where you have between 80 and over 100 Palestinian journalists killed in just a matter of weeks. What do Israelis understand is happening? The main question, Amy, is what they don't see or what they are not being shown. Because, as you know, and as your viewers definitely know, Israeli media is quite a free media, commercial-owned, uh, quite liberal, no pressure from the government or secret services or army or things like this. Anything it does, it does voluntarily. And the Israeli media decided almost wall to wall, maybe except of my newspaper, Haaretz, all the rest. It's not only TV, also newspapers. They decided that they are part of the Israeli propaganda machinery. They stopped being journalists. And this they do in two ways. The first one is the most serious one. They don't show Gaza. The Israeli average viewer doesn't see Gaza at all. He sees the soldiers. He sees the families of the hostages. He is being told day and night about the Israeli sacrifice. He is being told day and night how brave are the soldiers. You see it seven days a week, 24 hours a day, and only one thing you don't see, the suffer of Gaza. And the media decided not to show it, not because anyone pushed the media not to do it. They do it because they know very clear that this is what their viewers don't want to see and they want to please them. And by this, they are betraying our first mission, to tell the full story. You know, there are Israelis who wouldn't care less to see all those uh, terrible images and say, Hamas is to be blamed, the Arabs are, are to be blamed, they deserve it, they are barbarian, everything is fine. But they have to see what is being done on our behalf. So that's the first level. The second level, which is less important, but still must be mentioned, is that Israeli media speaks now only in one voice. There is no room for any critic about the war. There is no room for any question marks. I don't remember a war in which, after so many stages, still the entire media is just a pale echo of the propaganda machinery of the army. Uh, well, Gideon, your newspaper, Haaretz, is a, a somewhat different from the rest of the press, but uh, how widely read is it within Israel, and, and who reads a Haaretz? Haaretz is not a, not a big a newspaper in terms of quantity, but it is still quite a influential newspaper, 
both abroad, as you know, because it's uh, being published both in English and in Hebrew. And also in Israel, still parts of the elite are reading it. I don't want to say that every Israeli reads Haaretz, but every Israeli knows about Haaretz. And through the social media, it has some kind of influence, but it is obviously very limited. Can you talk about <clears throat> the levels um, in Gaza we're hearing about? of starvation that every Palestinian is hungry right now, the babies being pulled from the rubble. I mean, we're thousands of miles away from you. Uh, Tel Aviv is very close to Gaza. What do they see when it comes to casualties? Nothing. They hear the figures, but figures are only figures. It's only statistics. It doesn't make you feel, it doesn't make you understand the scale of the tragedy, the scale of the crimes, I must say. You know, you watch all the international networks and you see Gaza. You see the children dying on the, on the dirty floors of the hospitals, bleeding to death. You see the uprooted people, you see the destruction. You see the suffer of, of hundreds of thousands of people, and obviously the starvation. And in Israel, you see only the soldiers, only the families of the hostages, only the scenes where you don't see Palestinians at all. It seems as if they don't exist. Now, Amy, that's not new, because the Israeli media betrayed the coverage of, betrayed its, its, its mission by covering in the same way the occupations throughout so many years. It was always dehumanizing the Palestinians as much as possible. But this time we reach a level that I don't, don't, don't remember such a level, because you can really watch for hours Israeli TV and have no clue what's going on in Shifa Hospital or in other hospitals or in uprooted neighborhoods. And where are the people? How do they make their living? Do they get some food? Nothing of this. Nothing which might remind us that the Palestinians are human beings. This is almost a taboo. Don't mention them as human beings. Uh, Gideon, Prime Minister Netanyahu keeps uh, assuring the international community that Israel does not intend to permanently occupy Gaza. But what is he saying domestically to the Israeli people? He, he even has two Twitter handles, one that's an official one, and then another that is uh, more geared toward uh, sending out incendiary messages to the population. Just this morning, he was quoted in a private talk, I think, that the war will continue at least until 2025. And nobody sees the end. Nobody knows the end. There is no end game. There is no plan what to do the day after. And Israelis start to believe now that it, this might last for many years, at least the occupation of Gaza, obviously without intention. Almost everything that Israel did in the last decades was without intention. But it always came out. It never intended to go for wars. And it always finds itself in war. It never intended to, to, to create an occupation of, of over 50 years. And it came out like this. No, no. The intention is one thing and the results are another thing. Israel has no plan to leave Gaza in the coming months or years which doesn't mean that Israel will stay there. But I don't see any alternative right now. Where, where, what will they do? I wanted to ask you about your paper, Haaretz, reporting that a group of family members of Israelis who were killed in Kibbutz Be'eri on October 7th um, in the Hamas attack on Israel are demanding a probe into how their relatives died. An Israeli brigadier general recently admitted he ordered an Israeli tank commander to fire on a home where Hamas fighters were holding 15 Israeli hostages. Brigadier General Barak Haram told The New York Times he'd ordered the tank commander to, quote, break in, even at the cost of civilian casualties. 
13 of the Israeli hostages died. Only two survived. Gidon, you're a member of the Haaretz editorial board, which recently ran a piece headlined, The IDF Must Investigate the Kibbutz Be'edi Tank Fire Incident Right Now. Elaborate on what happened and the investigation your editorial board is calling for now. Look, everyone is postponing all the investigation to the day after, and the day after seems to get far and far, and we are very concerned that it will never be investigated. But here we have a very concrete case, and families, rightly so, want to know who is responsible for the killing of their beloved ones and how did it happen. The, the brigadier general that you just mentioned happened to be a settler. I don't want to say that it says a lot, but let's remember that many of our uh, high rank generals, or more and more of them, are settlers. And settlers have their own ideology, even when they serve in the army. They have their own mot motivation, which is not always a very secular motivation. It's not always the motivation of the others. But in any case, the fact is that those people were killed and might have been rescued. It must be investigated. It's not very complicated to investigate it. It's a very concrete and focused event, and we were calling the army to do so. I don't know. Until now, we didn't hear from the army. I hope they will do it, because this can have also a lot of consequences in the coming days or weeks or months in Gaza, because this situation must, might repeat itself when we will face a house where there are hostages and commanders of Hamas. Do we shoot them all dead? I really wonder. And you also had a piece on how sexism ultimately killed what are known as the spotters, the uh, Israeli military, the women uh, who were on the border, who were seeing Hamas gear up, were telling their supervisors, it looks like there's about to be an imminent attack. Um, and some were even told if they raise this again, they would be brought up on charge of insubordination. Is that right, Gidon? Yeah. Uh, we had a big story on this, but you know the small stories might uh, over overwhelm or overshadow the big story because the big story finally there are two big, huge question marks: a what happened on the seventh, and how did it happen? Because all those stories get to one conclusion that there was no army on this day, there was not the, the most sophisticated intelligence in the world with all the most sophisticated devices, who knows the color of the underwears of each Palestinian, all of a sudden didn't know anything, after all the money in which invest, was invested there and all the reputation they have. And then came the second question, where was the army after the attack started? No army whatsoever. And above all, the question which bothers me more than anything else, and that's namely, Having said what happened in, on the 7th, as barbaric as it was, whatever it was, there are question marks about certain events on the 7th, but it's very clear that there was an attack, a very aggressive attack. Does this give us Israelis the right to do anything we want after the 7th, forever, without any limits, no legal limits, no moral limits? We can just go and kill and destroy and destruct as much as we wish? That's the main question right now. The event the, the, that you mentioned uh, with those uh, soldiers, girls, just show how unprepared and unprofessional was the intelligence and the army. And, of course, most of those young women died. Um, last question, your biggest piece, if it isn't a genocide Only in Gaza. Only two survived. Only two survived. Yeah. Only two. Uh, if it isn't a genocide in Gaza, yeah. then what is it? We just have 30 seconds, Gido. Listen, the Israelis don't seem to care that so many Palesti innocent Palestinians were killed. They just care how to label it, if it's genocide or not. And I say it doesn't matter what is the legal definition. 24,000 people, most of them innocent people, 60, 70 percent of them women and children, 10,000 children among them. This is enough of a fact that nobody can deny, by the way, to ask ourselves, do we really have the right to do it? What does it tell about us 
about our moral standards, and above all, how long will we go on and where are we aiming to? Another 25,000 uh, killed people in Gaza will guarantee more security to Israel? And even if yes, do we have the right to do so? Gideon Levy, Israeli journalist, author, columnist for the newspaper Aretz, also a member of the Haaretz editorial board. We'll link to your piece. If it isn't a genocide in Gaza, then what is it?